And we will pick up where we have left off in our series here, Following the King. He is the King, there's no question about it. The, the, the problem is not Him, it's me. I don't follow Him like I should. And so Matthew is just a wonderful book about how you and I, as people who have placed our trust in Him, how are we supposed to follow then Him as our King? And probably the greatest treatise on doing that is Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. Here's what it means to be a disciple. Here's what it means to follow the Lord. And as our, our um, verses talk about in the morning, and men, I'll take that off of mute. I apologize. That was my fault. Um, as our verses in the, the morning, our, our verses September 1st, hello, we're there. Hi. <laughs> as our verses in September uh, talk about, I'm supposed to do that every day. Not just Sunday, not just when I feel like it, not just when things are going well in my life. I'm supposed to follow my king when I'm in the valley, when I, when I don't feel like it, when, when things aren't going the way that I expect them to or like I would want them to, uh, I'm supposed to be following. And so if you found Matthew 5 and verse number 21 is where we're going to be this morning. Matthew 5, verse number 21. Let's stand to our feet if you're physically able and we'll read just a few verses here of Scripture this morning. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time. Um, Brother J. Wu, if you wouldn't mind just turning me down a couple of notches. I'm getting ready to ring and I'm going to get a little bit louder. So, amen. <laughs> Thank you. Ye have heard that it was said of, by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. Whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, Thou shalt by no means come out thence, till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. Let's pray this morning. Lord, again, we've prayed a few times, and, and Lord, we have asked for your help. We want to certainly do that again today, because we are people that stand in need of help. We need a lot of things, but what we need today is your assistance to understand what's being said, and then, Lord, your convicting power to help us understand where we fall short here, where, where we are guilty of what certainly you're trying to get across to us, to our mind, to our heart. And then, Lord, please help us to respond in the way that would be fitting of your speaking to us. Thank you for being Almighty God. Lord, thank you that at the same time that you're Almighty God, ruler of the universe, keeping everything together, you care about our needs here this morning in this church in Austin, Texas. You love us, and Lord, you, you want to see us change for the better to be more like your son. Help us, please, to follow you today. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. So we've been a few couple weeks out of this with the missionary and then the anniversary Sunday. And I, every time I read through this, I, I can't help but get a, I just get enraptured or enthralled with verse number 20. Because verse number 20 is really the, the key to understanding the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. If I understand what Jesus is trying to get me to, to understand in, in verse number 20, then I will be, it's going to be much easier for you and I to understand the rest of this sermon. Verse 20 is like the, the big idea, if you will. Here's, here's the, the whole thing that I'm trying to get you to understand is, except, verse 20, your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. And then the rest of the, the chapters, the, the rest of the sermon is, here's what that then looks like. Here's how verse 20 is lived out. In verse number 21 begins 
six different times where Jesus is going to uh, give to us as we read it and to those who he is preaching this message to, he's giving us some understanding that, okay, ye have heard it said. This is what the scribes and Pharisees have told you. This is what they have been speaking to you about in the synagogues or by the way, wherever they have taught this, this is what you've heard. But then in verse number 22, he gives a contrast. But I say unto you, this is what you've heard, but I, who actually am the very Word of God, this is what I say to you. And so as you read those contrasts that Jesus makes, get in your mind that He's saying, okay, here's what you've been taught, but here's what the truth of the matter is. Because you've been following what you've been told, but what you've been told is wrong. And then He goes to explain in a variety of illustrations, here's why these things are wrong. Here's why this is different than what God has intended for your life. And so, okay, verse 20 is important. So as I read verse 20, as I think, okay, this is the big idea of the sermon. This is what Jesus is trying to get me to understand. Then I ought to be asking the question, what then is righteousness? What is it to be made righteous? How can my righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees? And if, if, if my righteousness is supposed to be different than theirs, and this is what they're telling me to do, then where do I find the righteousness that Jesus Christ is speaking about? How do I make that or, or gain that to be a part of my life? And as Jesus gives, gives the statement in verse number 20, he doesn't leave it up to chance or for us to guess about anything from verse number 21. Again, there, there are six different times he says, Ye have heard it, but I say unto you. And it's a wonderful thing that he does that because what they were told was different than, than what they were supposed to be doing. What the scribe and Pharisees were doing were mishandling and mistreating the Scripture to make it fit to what they thought they could live up to. Well, here's the, the list of good things that I think and I, I believe I can hold up to. And so what I'm going to do, this is the scribe and Pharisee, what I'm going to do then is I'm going to make this the list for everybody. If you will do these things, then you will be righteous. And they take the words of, of God's law and they, they turn it ever so slightly to be able to, instead of thinking of the heart aspect, it's purely the act, the, the, the doing of things, all right? Again, mishandling, mistreating the Scriptures. And so, again, Jesus says in verse number 21, ye have heard it said, but I say unto you. When Jesus quotes the, the Old Testament Scriptures, as you go throughout the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when He quotes the, the Old Testament, He will say, it is written. Or, have ye not read? So when he begins in verse number 21, he's not quoting Old Testament Scripture. He's just saying, here's what these sorry dogs have been saying to you. You've heard it said unto you. And remember again Jesus' words in verse number 17. Look back at verse number 17 of Matthew 5. Think not, he says, that I am come to destroy the law. So when he says in verse number 21, you've heard it said, verse number 22, but I say unto you, he's not changing the Bible. He's not changing what God said in the Old Testament and then coming up with the New Testament, though some preachers today would say that. Well, so what Jesus was doing was He was changing the whole, the whole dynamic. No, that's not what He's doing. Verse 17, He said to you and to me, I'm not come to, to destroy it. I've come to fulfill all of those things. To give you the true meaning of what God said in the Old Testament and where He was trying to get to is your heart. <laughs> not to get you just to stop doing things or to start doing things. It's supposed to start here. If my heart is right, then you understand my outward actions are going to begin being right. I'm going to start doing things that I should, stop doing things that I should not. And so Jesus is saying, He's concerned with the inner man as well as the outer man. Rather than just the outward show that these Pharisees were giving, Jesus wants my heart to be changed. Because if we're completely honest today, you and I would say, most people can give a good appearance. You have a good set of clothes that are your Sunday go-to-meeting clothes. 
And I know I'm supposed to do something. I'm supposed to give God my, my absolute best in, in what I, how I present myself and, and the way that I come to worship Him. And so most of us can put together a, a good appearance. We can look like on the outside that everything is okay, but God sees past my outside. And He sees what's going on in my heart. He knows the, the reasons why I do things. And, and He knows my, my attitudes that I have that no one else maybe can see. He, he sees all of those things as well as my actions. And so he's concerned with what men and women, boys and girls, are on the inside as well as the outside. He would say, Jeremiah chapter number 17, verse number 10, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Revelation chapter number 2, verse number 23, All the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. We mentioned about Eliab and the prophet Samuel in just, just recent weeks. 1 Samuel chapter number 16, verse number 7, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. And please don't misinterpret that passage of Scripture to say, well, see, I can look any way that I want to, and you shouldn't be judging me. God's caring about what's on my heart. The issue with Eliab in the context is, he's the best-looking one in the bunch. He's the one that put on the outward appearance, and he's taller than everybody else. And then he looks like he's the next king, and yet God says... It's not just about the outside. It's what's in Eliab's heart that matters. Because we will read, as you read through that passage of Scripture, you get to 1 Samuel chapter number 17 and 18, when David fights Goliath. You know who the first accuser of David is, of doing wrong? is Eliab. Because Eliab has pride in his heart. And he's jealous of his brother. And God knows those things. And so God is saying then in the New Testament, as he's preaching this message, Jesus Christ is preaching this message to these multitudes that have gathered around him, it's not just what you do on the outside. I care about the inside because I can see the heart. The scribe can't see your heart. The Pharisee can't see your heart. By the way, those of you that follow the scribe and the Pharisee, you can't see their heart. And Jesus would say several times, what dwells in them is wickedness. You painted the outside white, <laughs> but on the inside is death. And so it's, it's interesting to me that as we get into to verses 21 through 26, it just is interesting to me that Jesus starts where, honestly, where a lot of people start in their, their conversation about the gospel and really about their, their, their attempted rejection of why they don't need the gospel. This is what I've had said to me. Well, I mean, sure, I'm a sinner, but I mean, I haven't, you know, I haven't killed anybody. <laughs> like, that's the, the, the deal. Like, that's the line. You know, if I kill somebody, then I have to get saved. No, you're a liar. And the Bible says in the, in the book of Revelation that all liars shall have their place in the lake of fire. So you're already in trouble. By the way, you came out lying, right? You came out just crying and screaming and angry and mad. You're wicked, man, as a little baby. You need the Savior. See, it's, it's not just what you think is right, what, what your standard is, it's what God's standard is. And His standard, as we turn to the end of Matthew chapter 5, and you don't have to turn there, we, we've referenced the verse, but verse number 48 says, I have to be perfect. Well, again, how do I get there? What, what is that going to mean in my life? Verse 21, Ye have heard that it was said of, by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Okay. Anybody in here in favor of just letting murderers just go scot-free? I would hope not. <laughs> I would hope that we would all come to the conclusion that murder is sin. Murder, murder is a crime that needs to be punished in like manner. That's just a Bible principle. The Pharisees in Matthew chapter 5 were not against punishment for murder, for, for committing the act. 
But what they had done is they, would, they had emphasized just the outward act of murder and, and capital punishment as, as God had prescribed, rather than, again, to, to nail it down, the heart attitude that brought about premeditation. Thinking about the, my fellow man that I hate them enough to take their life. That's the issue Christ is getting to. Okay, you might say it's bad to commit the act, but what do you do in your own heart? What is your attitude when somebody mistreats you? What do you think about that person when, when they say things that are not true about you? What, what goes on in your emotions when you get hurt by someone else? Because if you're not careful, with the attitude that you have, Jesus says in these passages, you're guilty of murdering that person already in your mind. You would rather them be dead than them continue to live. And they paid no attention. The Pharisee and the scribe paid no attention to the hateful, prideful, scornful thoughts in their mind and their heart. Their only concern was, well, I didn't do that. I didn't commit that act. But the internal anger, in our verses this morning, the internal anger is what drives men, by the way, not just crazy psycho people, I'm talking people like you and me, drives people to take somebody else's life. And it starts with anger. It starts with bitterness. And we don't get those things taken care of, as Jesus is going to help us understand. I tell you, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. And we have to understand sin left undealt with in our lives is going to cause us all kinds of, of heartache. So just some things here that Jesus says. We'll get into the message here. Number one, Jesus says unjustified anger is a sin that affects how you and I view ourselves. My unjustified anger affects how I view myself. And what are you talking about? Well, look at verses 21 and 22 again. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. So there's this ugly truth that happens in, in every one of our hearts. And, and I, I just beg you to be honest with yourself this morning because God knows what already goes on in your heart. So just, it's okay to be honest. I think we're in church. Yeah. It's okay to be honest and just say, you know what? I, I, I can harbor some, some anger, some hatred in my heart towards somebody who does something even against me. And the fact that I elevate myself, and this is what Jesus is getting at in these couple of verses, is that when I begin to hate somebody else or I harbor bitterness or anger in my, my heart towards somebody, what I do is I elevate myself. I excuse my view, my way of doing things. The, 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 the times that I may have harmed somebody else, I forget about that. And I put that person who has done that to me, I put them lower in my perspective or in my view. And you see, you understand how I begin to, it affects how I view myself. Well, I'm not as bad as them. I mean, they talked about me behind my back and they, they did these, these unkind things to me and they said these things about my family and on and on and on and on. And we excuse ourselves away. That's what Jesus is trying to get the Pharisees and scribes to understand. You're excusing your sin in your heart and yet you're, you're, you're putting heavy burdens on people that you don't even worry about. And they, they minimize this heart issue of murder. They simply taught. That someone who had committed the act of taking someone else's life was, was certainly, should be taken to a court of law and tried. In fact, he says in verse number 21, in danger of the judgment. But that makes the, the greater wickedness of the heart and, and it misses the, the issue that, that's going on in their heart, in their life. The entire issue is boiled down to this, this outward process and, and strictly outward rather than dealing that the murderer when they take someone's life, they are demeaning the very image of God. Um, I, don't, I don't particularly care how beautiful you are this morning, or how handsome that you are, or really how ugly that some of us are. <laughs> now, 
the issue is I've been made in the image of God. That's not a prideful statement. That's just the truth of what the Bible says. You are made in God's image. And God says that when he created you, you are important to him. You are so important that he gave his only begotten son to die on the cross for your sins. To save your soul. And so what a murderer does is they demean God's image in that, the life of that person. By the way, wouldn't we say the same thing about abortion today? Is that little one created in God's image? You better believe that they are. You better believe that they are. And so when, when we uh, go to the pole or we, uh, uh, we think in our mind and we're trying to come up with our own philosophy of life, so to speak, or our own dynamic or how we're going to live our life and our belief system, you better make sure you're lining up with what God said about human life. And then, okay, if that's the case for the person who commits the act of murder, and Jesus says, if I harbor anger and bitterness in my heart towards somebody, I've committed anger, or I'm committed murder, rather, in my heart, you understand how I'm demeaning the very image of God, of that person, in my own mind, in my own heart? I, though I do it oftentimes subconsciously, I am saying that person is of less value than I am. I'm more valuable to the world than that person is. I am going to take their life. And I'm, I'm glad, honestly, it's a little bit quiet because it, it, you ought to be thinking about this stuff. This ought to be a sobering thought. That boy, what goes on in my heart when I get frustrated or, or angry at somebody? Jesus is, is saying, I ought not be found doing that. It's very serious when that goes on. I think the Pharisees are missing the, the truth of what David said in Psalm 51 and verse number 6. He, he's confronted with his own sin. And Psalm 51, Psalm 32 are those, those confessionary psalms that he, he, he writes. And he says this in verse number 6 of Psalm 51. Behold, thou, God, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, not just in the outward because David had everybody fooled. And for all intents and purposes, he had done everything that he could to cover up his sin. But yet, Nathan comes in and says, Thou art the man. God still knew. God was still dealing in David's heart. And David had to come to the point where he said, God, you desire truth on the inside, not just the, the hypocrisy that I have been putting out on the outside. And because the focus was completely external, the Pharisees, what they were doing, these scribes and Pharisees, they, they viewed themselves, their view of themselves became entirely complimentary. Well, Lord, thank you that I'm not like that man. You know, I mean, I, I do these things and I give and I pray and I fast and, and uh, I, I've done everything, Lord, that you told me to do. And I'm glad, though, that I'm not like this person who's a liar and a cheater and an adulterer and a murderer and all of those things. And they missed entirely what God is trying to do in their heart. By the way, Christian, you do the same thing. Yeah. How do I know? Because I are one too. And I'm guilty of these things. And God has to work on my heart about Okay, what do you think or what are you feeling toward that person or toward those, those people? By the way, um, you ever get mad when somebody differs from you politically? Oh, we're not going to go there, I guess. All right. Why, why do you think protesters look to take people's lives in St. Louis, Missouri? Because they think their way is the only way. And they have more value than somebody else. And if you disagree with me, then I'm going to take your life. See, our, our view of God is, is totally out the door. In verse number 22, Jesus says that any of us who have been angry with someone else without a cause is the phrase that he uses. That is, it means literally without reason or in vain for, for nothingness is guilty of murdering that person in their heart. He is as concerned with the the thought of it as he is with the physical shedding of blood. And it's right or proper, by the way, it's right or proper for you and I in the world that we live in, in the world that they lived in, to have what the Bible refers to as holy or righteous anger. Righteous indignation. You may have heard that phrase. Jesus was angry, uh, the Bible says, when he went and drove out the money changers. Right? Why is he angry? Because what they were doing... He's not hating them. He's hating what they are doing. 
They're taking God's house and making it a house of a, a den of thieves is what the word that he uses. They're, they're ripping the people off. And he says, this is supposed to be a house of prayer, not a way for you to profit off of, off of whatever it is that you're selling here. By the way, they're selling sacrificial animals, trying to take it and exploit the, the poor folks. And so it's, it's okay to have holy or righteous anger against sin. But what Jesus is talking about here in Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 26, is an unholy anger that we can have against people. It's anger that has settled inside of us. And that's literally the wording that Jesus used. Anger that's settled inside of you. And you, you nurture the anger and you allow it to grow and to fester these feelings and these emotions. Um, you would understand the term to nurse something. You, you're nursing anger in your heart. You just, you never deal with it. You just allow it to continue to grow and grow and grow and grow. And it turns into hatred and, and cursing and maligning another person, either outwardly or even inwardly. And he's not talking about anger over God, um, about God being dishonored, righteous anger against sinful philosophies even. We, we ought to be standing strong and angry about the abortion issue. And just, we'll, we'll, I'm going to pick that one. Right? Uh, we ought to be angry when a, a person who does commit the act of murder gets let out. We ought to be angry about that. We ought to be angry when the politician welcomes drug use and abuse into our society. We ought to be hopping mad about that. That is against God's righteousness. But at the same time, God says, I'm not supposed to put my anger or hatred toward that person. It's toward the, the sin that they're committing. Because I cannot hate that person and at the same time uh, want to share the gospel with them. It's not going to happen. What I might think is, boy, I, I think I know where they're going and I'm glad about it. And though we wouldn't say it with our mouth, we think it with our little mind. Boy, there's a cold place or there's a dark, hot place in where they're going. And I'm going to enjoy seeing them get there. No, that's the wrong attitude. That's not how I'm supposed to live this Christian life. So how's it seen in my life? Well, how about uh, anybody hold a grudge? Yeah, it's still quiet. You ever have this bitterness that just kind of smolders in your heart and in your life because you refuse to forgive somebody? How about the anger that just cherishes when, when uh, resentment is given, when there's, there's, you, you hate and you do not want to even see that person, you don't want to reconcile with that person? That is, Hebrews 12, 15, that is the root of bitterness that can strike up in every one of us. Am I nursing those things in my life? Can, can someone who has never, this is just a question, can someone who has never been in trouble, so to speak, they've never been in trouble with the law, they've, you know, they don't have some criminal record at all, can someone who has never been in trouble like that, never said a, an unkind word against somebody else either that, you, that you've ever heard, can they be guilty of murder in their heart? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the greatest person you know can still be guilty of what we would consider be one of the most heinous crimes. Because they, they just harbor those things in their heart. And Jesus is trying to get these people to understand. You, you've heard it said, don't commit the act. But I say unto you, don't think it in your heart. Don't allow your, your mind to go there. Don't continue to harbor bitterness in your life. 1 John 3.15. Listen to what John said. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. It's, just, it's, it's clear and plain. Sociologists, psych psychologists don't often reference them, but they report that hatred brings a person closer to murder than does any other emotion. And hatred, they say, is but an extension of anger. Anger leads to hatred, which leads to murder in the heart, if not in the act. Anger and hatred are so deadly that they can even turn to destroy the person who harbors hatred and bitterness for somebody else. They can even turn that on themselves and take their own life. What a tragedy that we wouldn't get this, this issue, these, these 
problems. We wouldn't work hard to, to resolve those things. Or at the very least, you, you try to resolve and the other person doesn't want to and you say, I've done my best with that person. That's all that I can do. I'm going to try to still be their friend. But what do we do? What, what, what do some of us even, maybe even right now, what, what do we do? We justify what we've thought or we justify the feelings that we've harbored in our heart and, and we compare ourselves to someone who has actually committed the act. That's exactly what the scribes and Pharisees were doing. They're excusing their own thoughts and feelings, their own emotions, because they say, well, I, I, at least I haven't done it. But that's not true righteousness. That, that's not what Jesus is, is trying to get us to understand. So when I get angry and I allow that bitterness and that anger to grow, I'm also oftentimes guilty of elevating again my view of myself. I lower the view of the other person and I value myself over this, this other person who God has created. And I begin to view myself as better than them. And that's wickedness. I'm not better than anybody. See, if, I, if I'm confronted with the truth that God knows about me, I'm in trouble. Amen. I'm in trouble. And I, I might be the pastor of this church, but that doesn't excuse me from not dealing with the sin in my heart. See, I can have hatred. The next, the next set of verses, we're talking about lust. I can uh, harbor things that are in my life that no one else knows about except for God. And God says, son, those things need to be dealt with. So verse number 22, there's a, another illustration Jesus gives. He says, if, if you use the word, and, and the word is raka, it's a term of, of abuse, of derision. It's a term of slander for, for these Jewish people in this, in this culture. It was similar to calling somebody empty-headed or brainless, or a worthless person. That's what the term meant. It, it was a word of arrogant contempt. You understand if I, now I love Brother Roy, and I'm just using him for an illustration, all right? But if I call Brother Roy brainless, who becomes the standard? <laughs> like I got, man, shit, I got more brains than he does. I mean, look, his brain hasn't even pushed out the hairs on the side of him yet. My hair, my <laughs> pushed out all of the hair. <laughs> you understand I lift myself above Brother Roy when I say that you idiot that word's come out of my mouth and I, I, what I'm doing is I'm just saying I'm better than that person and I'm telling you if I don't get rid of that if I don't allow the Lord to get that out of my heart the Bible says I'm guilty of murder Why sin is so terrible. The damage it does to lives. Well, you watch people and you try to care for them and pray and pastor and yet the, the words that they say betrays what's in their heart. And you see how it affects families and relationships within a church and you know that there's some on and I'm not talking about our church I, I don't necessarily see this that I know of but in some places there's people on this side who would never talk to people or come in contact with people on this side because they harbor bitterness in their heart toward them and you can never expect God to use that kind of place if that just continues to go on Using that, that kind of language affects how we view ourselves and how we view the one that we're angry at. And we view ourselves as better than them. And then he continues in verse 22 and he says, even using the word thou, fool. The word is moros. We, we get our word moron uh, from this, this word. It's to call someone, again, a similar phrase, stupid or, or dim-witted. 
To call someone thou fool was to accuse someone of being both stupid and godless. You know what that is? That's an attack on that person's character and reputation. And again, you're lifting yourself up and putting them down. You're trying to make others' view of yourself and your pride to be better than what you think that person is. And the Bible says that's absolutely wickedness. That, that's not righteousness. You ever been so mad or angry at somebody that you began to question their character and reputation? Possibly you even started to make up things about them in your mind that maybe slandered their work ethic or their quality as a, a human being. Again, this is, this is our anger that just attacks constantly. It gets in our heart and it just stays there. It affects our view of ourselves. We, we lift ourselves out of the, the muck and we, we give ourselves the benefit of the doubt at the expense of someone else. And it's not right. Now, does this mean that we're not to stand against godlessness or wrong activity in our society? No, that's not what that means. We're, we're, we're called to do that. We've been given a duty to do just that. But guiltiness and, and unrighteousness comes in when we take our stand against the very person rather than the unrighteousness itself. And these, those two things are different and separate things. How do I know? Because I've seen people who didn't believe in God and, and use all kinds of foul language and, and, and treated people terribly and lived their life only to themselves, come to the realization that they need Jesus Christ, their personal Savior. And you know what stopped? Foul language. Hatred toward other people. It wasn't the person, it's the sin inside of them. It's their proclivity to go toward sin rather than toward Christ because that's what our flesh t wants to do. And so I have to separate those two. That person doesn't hate me. They're not my enemy. It's the sin that's the problem. And so I hate the sin. And as we have heard, there's truth to, but I love the sinner. I, I care for the sinner. I'm certainly glad someone cared about me. When you remember that every person, again, is made in God's image and anger is properly directed against sin and wickedness, anger directed at another human is sin. Now, we're out of time. I want to just finish this. I'll give you the points and we'll, we'll move on through. Number one, unjustified anger is a sin that affects my view of myself. But Jesus says that unjustified anger then in verse number 23 affects how I worship God. You have, you have anger and bitterness in your heart and yet you're going to come to church and think that you're worshiping God? That doesn't work. That's hypocrisy. And so he says, if you come and you, you bring your sacrifice, your offering to the priest, before you hand over that offering to the priest, and remember, as I'm carrying my offering, I'm holding it in my hands, and I'm identifying my sin with this offering. This offering is going to take my place, so to speak. When the, the, the priest sheds its blood and puts it on the, the altar, it's in my place. And so before I transfer that to the priest, I have to understand, wait a minute, my brother has something against me. And so he says in verse 23 and 24, put your sacrifice down, go make yourself and your heart right with your brother, that other human being who has a problem with you, 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 you have something that, that's burdening the relationship, make that right before you come and worship God. Amen. Have a clean conscience when you come to worship God. Don't expect that just putting on a good face or attending church or singing some, some songs and, and being ministered to, don't assume that's going to take care of the issue because it's not. You personally have to deal with your God. Those burdens He can and will take away if you'll give them to Him. You confess, you agree with God about your sin. He says He is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Then third and finally, 
unjustified anger is a sin that affects my relationship with other people. And he finishes in verses 25 and 26. And he just really he gives some, some illustration, some, some uh, commentary, if you will, on the previous verses. Agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge. And the picture is, we're going to court over this, this matter that we can't, we can't agree on. We're going to court. And as he's bringing me to court, I've offended him. And as we're going, it, the law was, if we made amends on the way, then the legal court didn't have to get involved. The judge didn't have to render his verdict. And so the Bible says, if you've offended someone, then make it right. Don't go harbor bitterness, even if they don't like you. You are supposed to be the one to take the first step. But wait a minute. I'm the offended one, or I'm the one that's offended. Either way, the Bible says, you go. So you understand if we've got those that have been the offender, trying to make amends, and you've got those who are the offended, Trying to make amends? I think we're probably going to come to make amends. But if we've got one person out of that group, it takes two to tango, so to speak, and you've got one person out of that that is unwilling to make amends, then again, my responsibility is just to do what God is telling me to do. Ask Him to deal with the bitterness and hardness in my heart. Ask Him to forgive me for what I've done to that person. And then all that I can is say, Brother Tim... I'm sorry for what I said. I shouldn't have done that. I'm, I'm sorry for the action that I did. I, I, I didn't mean to do that. And then it's Brother Tim's decision whether he says, I forgive you. Let, let's make amends here. Or to go about his way. And then there's bitterness in his heart. Well, I've done what I could. That's what Jesus is saying. Deal with the heart of the matter. True righteousness is inward and that it projects itself outward, not just well, I didn't do it, but you did it in your heart. So, do you have true righteousness? Are there st is there stuff in your heart that you know shouldn't be there? Then today, 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 in fact, verses 25 and 26, you know what the impetus is? Immediately. Do it now. Do it now. The day of salvation is today. The day of restitution is today. The day of forgiveness is today. Do it today. Because tomorrow might be too late. You might not have any other chance to do it. Do it today. Lord, please help us. Help us to be obedient to what your word says. This is, this is following the king. So Lord, help us to follow you. Lord, we ask for help because we're sinners. We can have bitterness in our heart. We can struggle in areas of... of harboring things and nursing things and emotions where others have hurt us. And Lord, the prescription that you give in verses 21 through 26 of Matthew 5 is for us to go to the person. For us to take the steps to go, to make it right, to make amends, to mend the relationship. So Lord, then please help us to do that. Forgive us when we wickedly say things that we should never say. And Lord, even more so, forgive us when we think the thoughts and we try to hide it by not saying the actual words. Lord, please help our righteousness to be true righteousness, not hypocritical. And we'll be very careful to thank you for it. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Maybe you're here today and you never trusted Christ, your personal Savior. Listen, today's the day of salvation. Today is the day He wants you to do that. So you, no one's looking around. I'm not going to embarrass you. I, I just want to pray for you. My prayer is not what's going to save you. You have to make that decision on your own. But you just lift your hand. You'd be honest. Say, Preacher, you pray for me. I'm not sure that I'm saved. Thank you, boys. I see your hand. Thank you. You can put them down. Anyone else? Preacher, would you pray? I'm not certain that I'm saved. Preacher, would you pray? All right, then, Christian, how about you? If we're saved, then what's our righteousness look like? What's my heart attitude? What do I think about my fellow brother or sister? What do I think about my fellow human? Am I just mad and angry at them? And it affects how you think about yourself, how you worship your God. It affects how you think about others. Maybe today you just need to come and say, Lord, I agree. I, I haven't done right. Thank you for forgiveness. 
In just a moment, we're going to pray. We'll stand to our feet. We'll sing a hymn of invitation. The Lord speaks. You need to obey. Obey the Lord and come. Lord, please help us to make the decision during the invitation you'd want us to. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand if you would. Take out your hymn book. Hymn number 156 is where we're going to be this morning. Hymn 156. Just a couple of verses.